The song you just sang with us is a Trinitarian song. We gave worship to God that is only appropriate to God. We distinguished between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice how we listed them in the song in a particular order. And we use the titles as though significant. Maybe if we had added son here, I could say this with even more emphasis, but these are eternally, at least the first and the last, and this by reference, eternally significant titles. And we treated each of the three persons as equally worthy of worship. That's astounding. You've just participated in the fluent uh, speech of Trinitarian Christian discourse. Long before we hear the doctrine of the Trinity explained, Christians learn to speak Trinitarian discourse fluently. It's embedded in our preaching, our prayer, and our praise. John Dyer puts it this way, the Trinity is a doctrine, but it's also a pattern of faith and practice. Consider the speech of children. My 10-year-old Hannah is fluent in prepositions, subordinate clauses, and participles. She naturally, just listen to her, she just naturally uses prepositions. But she might not be able to tell you what a preposition is. Does that make sense? She, she, she probably, maybe she can today, maybe. <laughs> but she can speak fluently the English language, even though she can't tell you necessarily what all the grammatical constructs are. Children can be fluent in a language long before they can parse it, and they could speak it long before they can explain its grammar. This is similar to the doctrine of the Trinity. Richard B. Hayes writes, a person does not need to know theoretical grammar constructs in order to speak grammatically. In fact, it is the reverse. Think about this. You learn to speak before you learn to do grammar. <laughs> grammar is developed to explain the linguistic practices of those who speak a complex language with unreflective fluency. In the same way, the later doctrine of the Trinity is an attempt to describe and analyze the way in which Jesus Christ and the Spirit had become intrinsic to Paul's way of referring to God. So it's like saying, we as Christians learned to speak the Trinity long before we understood the theoretical con constructs around the Trinity. We just, it's, it's just a pattern of Christian life and it becomes embedded in how we speak and pray and worship long before we can make nerdy sense of it. I say this to encourage you. It's good for kids to learn grammar, and it's good for Christians to reflect on the Trinity, but many of you Christians are already fluent in the discourse of the Trinity. To learn more about the doctrine is to learn more about the grammar of a theological language that you already likely speak. The Trinity is not just for nerds. It's for common Christians. Neither is the doctrine of the Trinity an improvement upon what the Bible already has in it or teaches. To reflect on and summarize the Bible's teaching on the Trinity, on the triune God, is not to develop a doctrine that was only nascent or undeveloped in Scripture. We're not improving upon what Scripture says when we summarize what Scripture says. Scott Swain writes, What we have in the Bible is well-formed Trinitarian discourse, primary, normative, and fluent. Again, theology is like a grammar for what the Bible already eloquently speaks. Before we soar into the clouds, it's good to humble ourselves with a question. How much of God is incomprehensible? Is God only partly incomprehensible? Can we wrap our heads around a part of who God is? <laughs> Do we only need to concede mystery for the rest of him? Do we start with mystery or do we resort or fall back to mystery? I submit to you that a more faithful confession is that all of God is incomprehensible. All of God is great. All of God is infinite. He has no finite, comprehensible parts. God is not a combination of what can be grasped and what cannot be grasped. For us, this is, not a this is not a concession, this is a glad confession. We confess with Paul, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable 
are his judgments and inscr how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Note that for Paul, this is not a bitter concession. This is a glad confession. And with David, we confess, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. So for David, this does not provoke uh, a contempt or an alienation from God. This provokes a worship and a glad admiration of who God is. Paul the Apostle writes of God that he alone has immortality and that he dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see. The analogy of unapproachable light is very helpful. To comprehend God, to comprehend means to sort of wrap your head around. Think about drawing a, an intellectual circle around something and, and then sort of grasping it because you can, you can contain it within your mind. To comprehend God is like peering into the sun. You simply cannot do it. Your vision cannot penetrate into the center of the sun, not because it is full of darkness, but because it is overwhelmingly bright. Scott Swain puts it this way. The knowledge, love, and beatitude of the blessed Trinity is unapproachably high and holy, hidden, not because it is dark or arcane, but because it is supremely luminous. Scott Swain's a nerd. That just means very bright supremely lovely, surpassing what human eyes can see or what human hearts can imagine. Counterintuitively, the incomprehensible brightness of God is encouraging for our own understanding of who he is. Think about this. The very light that is unapproachable is the very light that helps us see. It is unapproachably bright, and yet, as it were, it brightens the room. Matthew Barrett puts it this way, and he's drawing upon Anselm. Like the sun, you cannot look at God without going blind. <laughs> and yet, we cannot see anything apart from the sun illuminating our way. I love tracing the attributes of God to points of encouragement. This is one here. Uh, this also reminds me of the eclipse. Has anyone seen the eclipse in its totality? You don't get to raise your hand if you've seen it partially. A total eclipse, it's categorically different if you've ever been in a total eclipse. Uh, you, you just, you experience the fact that it is uh, categorically different from a partial eclipse. And I remember the first time we did this with our kids up in Idaho, um, uh, they were young enough for me to be very anxious that there was a part in the event where you're tempted to look at the sun, but it's still very dangerous to look without the special glasses. So I, I was very, very distracted by helping my, my children uh, not look at the sun directly with that. that. Our knowledge of God is grounded in God's knowledge of himself. Think about this. God knows himself immediately and comprehensively and naturally and exclusively. You can see this in the first half of Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. No one knows the son except the father. And no one knows the father except the son. That is absolutely exclusive and immediate knowledge that only God has of himself. Now, now watch how that forms the basis of the next clause. And to anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Note God's exclusive knowledge of himself, and yet the verse celebrates that we can know God by God's gracious self-revelation. God doesn't know himself as a gift to himself. He doesn't have to choose to make himself known to himself. Our knowledge of God is different than God's knowledge of himself, but his knowledge of himself is the foundation for our knowledge of him. If this is the case, we cannot climb an intellectual ladder to know him. I'm not nerding out here, mainly. This, this becomes really, really important as we talk about the Trinity, and you're going to see that very clearly. We are utterly dependent on God to reveal himself. God is not a human invention. He's not the sort of being you would invent. 
The doctrine of God is unpredictably great. Mark Edwards writes, the paradoxical notion of three persons, each identical with one God, to, with the one God, but none identical to the other two, is one that no philosopher would have permitted to ensnare him if he were entirely free to choose his own premises. The doctrine of the Trinity is like acid to intellectual arrogance. At this point, you should feel helpless. If we cannot comprehend God, how can we know him? How can we speak of him or think of him? Let me share a distinction that has been tremendously helpful to me. And you're going to see this distinction in action later. Consider the difference, consider the difference between what is univocal, equivocal, and analogical. Pardon the nerdy terms, but it's very helpful. Just think about the categories. If we had if we had univocal knowledge of God, it would mean that we know God exactly as he knows himself, to quote Matthew Barrett. It would mean that our knowledge of God would map exactly onto God's own omniscience. It would be a one-to-one -one correspondence, our knowledge of God and God's knowledge of himself, if it was univocal, would map exhaustively and comprehensively. It would be equivalent. Equivocal knowledge is the exact opposite. It means that one does not truly know God. It treats knowledge of God as only, quote, subjective, inconclusive, and indefinite. You've probably heard the spirit of this in your postmodern conversation partners or cynic, modern cynics who are very cynical about the, the ability of language. In this view, God has not spoken truthfully of himself or clearly about himself. This is not an option for Christians. We believe God, that God has spoken. He has revealed himself. He has, he has expressed himself with verbal expressions that are meaningful. So we cannot say that our, our, our knowledge of God is univocal. We're not God. We're not omniscient. And yet we cannot say that God's speech about himself is equivocal because God has spoken truly. The third category is analogical language. To quote Matthew Barrett, analogical means something shares similarities with something else, but it is not identical to it. It is not totally the same, nor is it totally different. There may be discontinuity, but there is continuity in what is resembled. Barrett argues that analogical knowledge and language is especially appropriate for human knowledge of God. What are we? What, what are we made to be? What are we made in? We ourselves are what? We are an analog of God. We are in his what? Image. His image and his likeness. We are created to represent God by analogy. We are not completely unlike him, but we are not equivalent to him. We are in his image and likeness. Barrett concludes, so while we may not know God as he is in himself, in his essence, univocally, univocal knowledge, we may know him as he has made himself known to us by revelation, that is, analogical language. This is very important foundational work here. Uh, trust me as we we unfold. All this sets the stage for our discussion of the Trinity. We creatures are entirely dependent on God's analogical self-revelation to us. Adam, think about this, Adam made in the image of God had a task of what? Naming the animals. He was not given the task of naming God. Only God can rightly name himself. Scott Swain observes that God does this very thing. He names himself when he commissions. Quoting, quoting Swain, God sanctifies and commissions prophets and apostles to be ministers of his word by doing what? By naming himself in the presence. You see this in Exodus 
3. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say to this people of Israel, I am has sent you. Note here that God does not describe himself as a general category of being. He doesn't, he doesn't resort to something else to categorize himself. You and I are of the human essence, and we each have our own existence. We belong to a category, humanity, that is bigger than ourselves. We cannot speak of God like this. He does not belong to a species of being. He's not defined by something outside of himself. He simply is what he ultimately is without reference to anything outside of himself. Again, in Exodus 34, the Lord, that's Yahweh, descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God's people proclaim his name. Indeed, the Jews had a creed. Have you think about that? The Jews were a creedal people. The Jews were creedal worshipers. They confessed, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Moses sings in Deuteronomy 32, For I will proclaim the what? The name of the Lord and ascribe greatness to our God. David sings, My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. That God can give himself, that God alone can give himself a divine name. And that God alone shares in the divine name. And that he announces his name in the act of commissioning prepares us to listen closely at the baptism of Jesus. And when Jesus was baptized, Matthew 3, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. When commissioning his disciples, Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the, watch closely, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The unfolding of this divine name is breathtaking. Note, note here, Jesus commands a baptism in how many names? In one name of God, who is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That Jesus shares in the very divine name of God is now our creed. This is now our Christian confession. If you confess with your mouth, Paul says, and if you confess with your mouth that what? that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The Jewish creed is that Yahweh, this Lord, is one. The Christian tradition continues in this by confessing that Jesus is Lord. We're not contradicting that creed. We're continuing the tradition and the, the, the revelation of that creed. Jesus is Lord. Uh, it, sh it, should, it should strike you that if Jesus is not God, that's a blasphemous thing to say. Surely Paul has the Jewish Shema in mind, in the background, in the cognitive environment of early Christianity, when he says, Jesus is Lord. Scott Swain identifies three patterns of divine naming exemplified in 1 Corinthians 8.6. This is an underappreciated 
Trinitarian verse. This is a wonderful Trinitarian verse. For us, there is one God. And by the way, uh, the us there is Christians, Christian worshipers. Uh, on the street with my Latter-day Saint friends and neighbors, uh, there's sort of an us-them cosmic category uh, interpretation where there's many gods over other worlds and other dominions and regions of sort of the cosmic family tree of the gods. But for us on this planet, there is a particular God. There's sort of an us and them, those who have other gods and we have our gods. Really, the context here is idolatry and orthodox worship. For the idolaters, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of gods. <laughs> and you, beings you might call gods that are you know, inferior to uh, there's, maybe you call them heavenly beings, however you want to shake that out. But for us, who's the us? The Christian community rightly confessing who God is. For us, there is one God. Again, you should have the Shema right in the back of your mind as you, as you hear this. One God the Father from whom are all things, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we exist. The first pattern is a monotheistic pattern of divine naming. For us, there is one God and one Lord. <coughs> Scott Swain writes, the first pattern of divine naming that 1 Corinthians 8, 6 attests is a monotheistic pattern of divine naming. In this pattern of divine naming, the primary Christian, the primary Trinitarian language of the Bible identifies God, Jesus, and the Spirit with Yahweh, the one true God of Israel. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 offers an example of this pattern in its application of Deuteronomy 8, 6, sorry, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to God in Christ. The second pattern is a relational pattern of divine naming. For us, there is one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. Swain again. In this pattern, the primary Trinitarian language of the Bible distinguishes God, Jesus, and the Spirit from one another by means of their mutual relations. They are distinguished from one another by means of relation. The relations between God, Christ, and the Spirit are this is very helpful. Sorry if it's nerdy. Mutual, asymmetrically ordered relations. I should unpack that a bit. Early Christians observed that you cannot have the Father without the what? The Son. And you cannot have the Son without the Father. If the Father is eternal, then so is the Son. The Father is a title, an identity, that is co-relative with the Son comes together. You can't have, they eliminate each other. If one is absent, they're both absent. They only come together. If there is no father, there is no son. If there is no son, there is no father. They relate to each other. Their relations are mutual, but they are also asymmetrically ordered. The son is of the father, but the father is not uh, of the son in the same way. He's not, the Father's not from the Son. Paul does not collapse the Father and the Son. He distinguishes them, but they necessarily come together. The third pattern is a metaphysical pattern of divine naming. Quote, for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Swain. In this pattern, the primary Trinitarian language of the Bible indicates that God, Jesus, and the Spirit transcend the categories of creaturely being and creaturely naming. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 provides a specific example of the language of prepositional metaphysics. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> to describe God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ as the sole first and final cause of all things. I hope the grammar nerds here just got tickled uh, or were, were stirred up with joy. Let's, let's unpack that. Consider, for, uh, do I have that here? Consider Romans eleven thirty six. I don't have a slide for that. 
where Paul describes the transcendence of God over creation with prepositions. Most theology is expressed through prepositions. This is what Paul says in Romans 11. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. All things are from him. Their very existence is owing to him. All things are through him. The same power with which, God's, with, with which God creates. He preserves and providentially orders and sustains, as Hebrews 1.3 puts it. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. How did God create? By the word of his power. How does God uphold the universe? How does the Son uphold the universe? By the word of his power. All things are to him. Their final cause or their end or the, or the purpose for which they have their very existence. You realize you exist for a purpose. If you're not created, then you don't have, I mean, if you're not created, you are your own final cause. If you are created, you are created for a purpose and a final cause. What is the reason for our existence? It is for God. It is to God. You hear this also of Christ in Colossians 1.16. All things are created what? Through him and for him. All together from him, through him, to him, for him. God gets the best use of prepositions. Prepositions are ultimately for describing God's glory. When God names God, when the Bible names who God is, it reminds us not only of the, the oneness, the unity, the singularity of God, but the relations between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But it also comes packaged with a reminder of His transcendence over all of creation. Before we take a break, let me leave you with some questions that we will later address. What distinguishes the divine persons? What is it that makes the Father the Father and not the Son? What is a divine person? I tremble to ask that. What does it mean for a, a divine person to be a person? Why do we call the Father the Father, the Son the Son, and the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit? Do these names speak of divine persons as he is in himself? The fancy nerdy term for that is ad intra. There's ad extra, externalized, and there's ad intra, what God is in himself, independent of creation. It, are the titles Father, Son, and Spirit relevant to describing what God is in himself, irrespective of creation and redemptive history? What is the nature of Christ's sonship? Is it an eternal sonship? Or is it the kind of sonship that became what it is at incarnation or creation? Is it an incarnational sonship? Or is it an eternal sonship? Is Christ eternally the Son, but not eternally begotten? That is a, that's an option that some Christians have taken in the 20th century. Is the order of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit arbitrary? You ever thought about that? Why don't we list it out differently? Why don't we say Spirit, Son, and Father? Are these titles mere roles? In what sense is the Son of the Father and the Spirit of the Father and the Son? 